so as you can see, I just hit record. It should pop up on your screen that you approve it, but we do have to let you know we're recording this. Um, so you will be able to share it with other people afterwards. I'll email out a link and it'll be on our website. And if you have any questions, put them in the chat. Mike will uh, check it throughout or at the end. Um, I don't know, Mike, if you if you want people to unmute themselves and ask, um, we have, you know, we have about 100 people on here possibly. So sometimes that gets mm -hmm. a little much with the unmuting. Yeah, I mean, if it's if it is on the topic that we're on, then I'll do it. Otherwise, if we can, you know, uh, I'll usually it take about enough time that we have time to do questions at the end as well. So if we can go to them, that'd be great. All right, perfect. So those are the rules, Alan. Okay. All right. Uh, so everyone, one, thank you for joining us. Thanks for taking time out of your day uh, to join us and uh, learn a little bit about power filtration, IAQ. Um, you know, as we continue to learn about ways we can make our indoor air environment cleaner amongst uh, this world of COVID and other pathogens in the air. Um, you know, the demand for better filtration and better ways to make our indoor air cleaner with our existing systems has become more and more challenging. So with that, we've got Mike Farnsworth. He's our uh, regional commercial sales manager for Dy uh, Dynamic Air Quality Solutions. Mike is a Certified air filtration specialist, which I didn't even know that was a deal, but hey, uh, it is a deal, so that's good. My he's up in Wisconsin and uh, received his bachelor's science in from in architecture and urban planning from the University of Wisconsin. So uh, he left the cold uh, winter tundra to move out west, and uh, that's where he resides and helps us now. So, Mike, I'll let you. Uh, anything else you want to add into that? It's all yours. Yeah, I wouldn't be a Wisconsin guy if I didn't say go Packers. Uh, but other than that, I'm ready to go. <laughs> <laughs> all right, it's all yours. Yeah, so let me, thanks Alan, appreciate it. Um, let me get my uh, screen shared here. Just a moment. And we should all be seeing a PowerPoint, right? Perfect. Yes, sir. Awesome. Great. Um, yeah, like Alan said, I'm, I'm Mike. I'm the regional um, for Dynamic here on the West Coast. Uh, I've been working with uh, Alan and Veritech for about uh, four years now um, on a number of different projects uh, in his area and in sort of the Southwest region. Uh, I did see that there's some people from uh, the Texas area that are on as well. So you might be familiar with uh, Rich Gillick, who's my counterpart in sort of central and uh, east Texas uh, as well. Um, so Rich might be on also. But um, for those of uh, you who might not be familiar with Dynamic, um, we are a, a, a powered filtration company. Uh, we've been around since the 1980s uh, and we've been uh, manufacturing uh, air cleaning systems uh, since then. Um, some of the notable things that we've done include anthrax cleanups, valuable art collections in museums, uh, mission critical government facilities. Um, and before ASHRAE moved to their new building, we were the only air cleaning system in the ASHRAE headquarters. Um, so for that reason, and, and because our products are primarily based in, in sort of the simplified world, let's put it, of, of filtration, uh, we do quite a bit of work and have a bit of involvement with, with NAFA. So that's where the Certified Air Filtration Specialist aspect comes in. That's all through NAFA. Uh, we do quite a bit of work with the ASHES of the world. I just threw out the healthcare, for example, because we do quite a bit of healthcare here on the West Coast. Um, and we'll talk about it briefly, but you know there is an energy aspect to how filtration impacts our systems. And so uh, we do have some involvement with USGBC and some uh, lead projects, so we'll we'll kind of touch on that as we go through you know the air quality world and and, and what we do to help maintain it. Um, so, like I said, Dynamic primarily focuses on powered filtration technologies. So, uh, what we call that is, is actively polarized media, and, and what we're doing is we're we're putting we're putting filter media in an electrostatic field 
to polarize media fibers. Uh, what that also does is polarize particulate and helps improve filtration efficiencies of those filters. There's a couple other unique things that, that happen because of that, like the removal of ultrafine particulates, which we're, we're going to kind of spend some time focusing on today, uh, but also the ability to take out things like total volatile organic compounds and gas phase contaminants. Um, and as it pertains to the energy piece, uh, this type of filtration technology also uh, tends to have a higher dust holding capacity than most of your passive, comparable passive filter options. And that dust holding capacity contributes to less maintenance and, and maintaining a lower static pressure, for example. And so we'll, we'll kind of touch on that. Um, but to start, you know, we want to understand what is IAQ or, or indoor air quality. So if you think about the evolution of air and maybe what we referred to as indoor air quality, um, you know, we kind of joke internally about the progression that first man wanted heat and then, and then cooling uh, and then humidity control and, and now clean air. And so I think today we're all familiar with IAQ specific to the sense of providing good air quality. Um, whereas you could make the argument that heating, cooling, humidity control um, is part of IAQ or, or in, indoor environmental air quality, if you wanted to, to stretch it with the E. Um, but what is indoor air quality? Uh, ASHRAE in 62.1 defines it as air in which there are no known contaminants at harmful concentrations as determined by the cognizant, cognizant authorities with the substantial majority, 80% or more of the people exposed do not express discomfort. So. So some good guidelines, also maybe sort of a little broad, how do we, you know, how do we define that? Um, and, and sometimes it gets sharpened up a little bit more by going what we say beyond the basics and looking at other types of requirements for air quality. So OSHA of course has air quality requirements in terms of safe working environment. That helps sort of better define what, what indoor air quality needs to look like. Lead and well buildings, of course, have their their uh, descriptions of what what kind of air quality levels need to be met. Um, and then, of course, we can look at other applications, you know, things like healthcare and ASHRAE 170, for example, which which very very specifically define what what level of filtration or what kind of air quality is required for critical types of environments. Um, but I think at the end, what, what we when we look at the occupants, the, just our general occupancy, people are at a point of where they they need and expect clean air. And here comes you know the big scary slide. But of course, why is that really big now? COVID nineteen is is one of the biggest, of course, biggest factors that is really driving that that um, focus on on indoor air quality right now. <clears throat> Um, you know, but beyond just the challenges we're facing today with things like COVID-19, IEQ also has always been associated with um, improving building, uh, improving building through things like productivity. Um, I think most people are familiar with the sort of idea or pitch that, you know, if you clean the air and make indoor air better, your employees will work 5%, you know, more efficiently, and that's going to net you, you know, bottom line margin. You know, I think some of those things can be subjective while definitely valuable, but the other way that you can look at IAQ and productivity um, are, are operations and processes. So, you know, if I'm pulling from my experience in healthcare, for example, uh, if poor air quality shuts an operating room down for a day, that's $100,000 roughly a, a day of lost revenue for the healthcare facility. So IEQ can measure productivity, not just at the occupant level, but also your operations and, and, and processes level. And that becomes uh, important as well. And so when we look at this sort of large category in, in IEQ of what we're trying to satisfy occupants, as well as you know, building health and and building operations and and, and uh, processes, uh, it's important to to look at what's in the air and understand what what it is we're trying to take care of here. Um, so of course we know air is made up of nitrogen, oxygen, argon, carbon dioxide, and, and other gases. Um, but as it pertains primarily to indoor air quality, it's the what else that we're focusing on. Um, and in this case, um, in the filtration world, we're looking at 
three primary buckets, and that's particles, biologicals, and, and gas phase contaminants. So if we were to look at particulate, and maybe if more of the layman's term is just the generalized dust, um, is, is where we start with particulate. Um, this is anything from one micron to one millionth of a meter. Um, small, smallest thing in terms of dust that an eye can see is, is 10 microns. And, and these are things just as, you know, generated from people, textiles, vehicles, agriculture. Um, yeah, I think the sandstorm probably is a good representation of, of what we think of when we think of with, you know, when we think of dust. And, and the reason we put, I put the information in there about the size of dust is because the size of dust is what helps us determine what we need to do for filtration, right? And so we have our MERV levels and those different levels of MERV efficiency help us remove certain size particulates. So if you were to look at the typical atmospheric dust that we're, that we're dealing with, that you can, you can illustrate it with a graph like this, um, where you know visible dust and the large things that we're dealing with are on the left, and as you get to the right, and these and these particle sizes become smaller, you'll notice that as they become smaller, they also increase in count in terms of the quantity that's in the air. Um, so so as you get smaller, you get more stuff. Uh, the reason it's important to point that out is because traditionally we've we've followed particulate measurements on weight and volume so we're looking at the big basketballs when we look at the weight and the volume of particulate you can say that 97 percent of what's in the air is, is bigger than one micron um, and this is the stuff that we usually show you know show in our in our uh, gravimetric testing so pm10 and pm2.5 when those references are made that's in reference to a lot of this bigger stuff and this is typically what filtration has been geared towards managing, especially for keeping uh, HVAC equipment clean, for example. So the dust that builds up on coils, um, that's been the target of filtration, um, you know, pretty traditionally before the IAQ conversation uh, got really big. Um, now, the reason I'll jump to biological contaminants is because biological contaminants, while viewed as a separate bucket is really a subset of, of particulate. And the reason is, is because they have a size or a mass and reasonable filtration efficiency estimations can be made based on understanding what the size of that biological contaminant is. So that includes things like insects, but also mold and bacteria um, and viruses. And so um, when we look at viruses specifically in COVID-19, you know, we can start making some sense out of what the ASHRAE recommendations have been um, because we are looking at COVID-19 and, and, and its potential airborne transmission on things like droplet nuclei in the, in the context of particulate size. Um, and so, you know, we know that it's anywhere from a half micron to 10, 10 plus microns in size. Um, while also understanding that the virus itself is approximately 0.15 microns. So that's, that's smaller, you know, as a standalone virus, that's smaller than what a, what a HEPA filter is typically getting on a first pass. Um, and we also know with droplet nuclei being, a, being water-based in a dipole, it, it, as it's in the air, the moisture evaporates and it gets smaller. And so, um, while we're focusing on the larger particulate aspects of COVID right now, there's also the potential for things like droplet nuclei to evaporate, evaporate and become smaller and smaller particulate over time. And, and as that particulate gets smaller, the settling rate uh, increases. And that's where the risk of things like viruses or biologicals or COVID in this example uh, become a risk factor for becoming entrained in your HVAC system. Uh, so you'll notice that something that is a about a half micron in size can take up to 41 hours to settle. And that's the risk factor with things like viruses on droplet nuclei um, as they get smaller. And that's the risk with all small particulate in terms of the way they that they they uh, move through the air and, and what their settling rates are and, and their likelihood of being uh, entrained into our HVAC systems. Um, so so understanding, you know, how how that those small part particles relate to things like viruses or even pollution and, and how that uh, and how they how they settle it's important to kind of come back to the particulate sizes and and look at how we measure them by count because if we were to uh, count particulate just strictly count it and not measure by weight or volume 98 percent of what's in the air is smaller than a half a micron so by count the vast majority of what 
what we're dealing with for indoor air quality or just air quality in general is smaller than a half micron. And so, and so at a half a micron, and we'll look at the MERV parameters uh, table, at a half a micron, that can be below the effective range of, of many of our standard filters. And, and even at a MERV 13, isn't being fully uh, addressed in terms of its minimum efficient, uh, efficiency requirements. Um, and when you get that small, these are also where particles um, can bypass bodies' defenses, and they also tend to have a natural charge. So, um, you know, when you think about things like HEPA filters in a microelectronics facility, part of the goal is to keep charged particulate out of the processes so you don't create corrosion or microelectronic shortages, for example. And that's a and that's a, a factor of small particles that have natural charges to them. So, you know, as we get smaller and smaller, we look at what studies have determined to adversely impact IAQ, and and one of the big one of the big identifiers uh, is ultrafine particulate. So, uh, a big reason is because again, those small particles, and especially ultrafine particles, they have a they have a, a great ability to um, get into our pulmonary system, and, and the reason that can be can be bad is because um, Ultrafine particles uh, adsorb toxic air pollutants, so uh, oxidized gases, organic compounds, and, and transition metals. Um, that's one of the primary health concerns about ultrafine particles because of the, the way that they adsorb toxic. Uh, well, ocean toxic sounds so bad, but it's just the way that it's quoted. But they're they're adsorbing things like volatile organic compounds. So what exactly is an ultrafine particle? So if we think about it, HEPA filters are removing particles that are 0.3 microns at, a, at an efficiency rate of 99%, 99.97 to be technical, but um, ultrafine particles are, are particles that are 0.1 micron and smaller. So that's two microns smaller than what a, than what a HEPA filter is typically getting on its, on its first pass. And so, Again, when you when you do laser counting, when you look at an ultrafine counter, uh, a vast majority of what's in the air is is ultrafine, and and again they they carry adsorbed gas phase contaminants, and so because of that, the the NIH you know identified inhalation of ultrafine particles as a major source for introducing cardiovascular and pulmonary stressors into the body, um, and they also mentioned the depositing on electronic components uh, as well. And so when you think about where to, you know, things like ultrafine particles come from, you know, they also have sort of a relationship with the third bucket, which is gas phase contaminants. And, and of course, uh, I'm out in, in Oregon, so we deal with forest fires quite often. And uh, these types of events, or you can also take uh, uh, urban environments and, and think of things like car exhaust in terms of pollution. You know, these are types of, of either natural or man-made pollution factors that are producing um, things like ultrafine particulates in the form of uh, combustion or black carbon, as well as, as things like VOCs or volatile organic compounds, uh, you know, the hydrogen sulfides and carbon monoxides of the world. So um, if you think about how NIH uh, identified ultrafine particles and their ability to absorb to toxins, it makes sense why the air quality over the forest fire season this year become so so dangerous and so bad. Not only are you inhaling the actual VOC aspect of it, um, but you have a high density of ultrafine particles that are actively absorbing those contaminants and that are being breathed in by occupants, whether that's indoor or outdoor. So there's there's a relationship there um, in terms of what we're what we're attacking or, or trying to uh, filter between things like gas phase contaminants and and small particles. Um, and even further, you know, with things like COVID-19 and what we know about smart, small particles is um, studies have shown positive correlations between high levels of particles in outdoor air and transmission rates. So what that's suggesting is that things like viruses that can travel on droplet nuclei um, become maybe adsorbed or attached to things like small particles or ultrafine particles. And, and that could lend itself to the, the possible airborne aspect of COVID-19. Now, you know, I'm not sure if the WHO, if WHO or CDC's most recent um, positions have come out and fully said airborne or not. It's been kind of flip-flopped back and forth. Um, but ASHRAE and the HVAC community, I think, from, from day one have, have consistently identified the risk for airborne activity and 
um, that's a position that I'm aware of them having the, in terms of our understanding of, of things like viruses uh, in the HVAC community. Um, and we also saw in recent studies that uh, coronavirus attached itself to particles in the HVAC system. So again, um, looking back to the risk of airborne contamination, the risk of uh, it being trained in the HVAC system, and how do we mitigate those those risks with coronavirus? Those are all interactions with with small particulate, which is why the purpose of this presentation is to focus on smaller particulates and how we and how we can handle uh, removing them from the system. So. You know, that being said, how do we do it? How do we how do we maintain IAQ beyond just our large particle, um, our typical large particle aspect uh, for protecting HVAC equipment? Now, from a from a design standpoint, uh, there's sort of three a three pronged approach, and you know, from the I guess the side of designers and engineers, the first thing to do is always try to avoid it. Uh, source control, HVAC design, envelope design. Um, if you if you avoid it up front, it helps it helps that IEQ solution um, immensely. Um, the second solution is is dilution, you know, and, and that's been an, a common adage in the IEQ world for a number of years. The solution for pollution is dilution, and that's and that's what we saw from Ashray's recommendations early on in the COVID pandemic uh, was essentially to turn off all recirculated air, ramp the ventilation up in the exhaust. And constantly dump fresh air into uh, the, the building. Now, what we recognize in the IEQ world is that the outdoor air is not always, uh, especially in urban environments, not gonna, going to necessarily be cleaner than the indoor air. Uh, so, what we just talked about with the types of small particle, you know, pollution risks. Um, you know, opening your window in in downtown Seattle doesn't necessarily mean that you're bringing fresh or clean air in. So. So the the third sort of prong to it is remove, and that's and that's what we're that's what we're uh, where we're focusing with uh, filters and air cleaning technologies. Um, so of course, and, and I'll just kind of go through these these quickly, but you know, of course, avoid is is about source control, and so things like not smoking is a good example. HVAC design, uh, taking intakes away from exhaust vents or loading docks. Um, for our organization, the dynamic, we we do a lot of stuff with. Uh, solving issues as they relate to uh, like diesel trucks that idle outside of air intakes, for example. Um, and of course, envelope, isolate and exhaust indoor sources. Again, that's sort of what we're seeing with COVID. We're, we're isolating uh, COVID positive people, exhausting the indoor sources and bringing in fresh air. Um, dilution, of course, the primary dilution is, is replacing indoor air with outside air through ventilation. Um, 62.1 IAQ procedure is a little bit different, but that's that's replacing outside air with recirculated, cleaned indoor air. And of course, natural ventilation is is what we were just kind of joking about. Open the windows and 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 smell the breeze. Uh, but again, hopefully, there's not a, a school bus idling outside of your window. Otherwise, it's not going to smell very great. Um, so what we're going to focus on is removal, which is passive filters, is is the most common. And I do want to kind of take a moment to to note electrostatically enhanced filters, which is oftentimes confused with with what powered filtration does. Um, electrostatically enhanced filters are are your are your typical passive uh, filter products, um, and an electrostatic charge is applied to them as part of the manufacturing process uh, onto the media. And and Astra has done studies to show that this does, for a period of time, improve uh, filtration efficiencies. Uh, but that static charge does lose or dissipate uh, pretty quickly over a short uh, period of time, allowing that that filter to go back to essentially being a passive filter. Um, so that's where things like powered filters come in, where where that electrostatic charge is is actively polarizing the media. So the media is never losing that that charge, and therefore always maintaining its ability to improve its filtration efficiency. And then. The other thing I, I guess I would mention with, especially with COVID is we're seeing sort of the emergence of other technologies. UVC is really not very new, um, but it is occasionally used for particle and biological control. There's other things like photocatalytic oxidization, ionizers, um, and activated carbon, uh, which, is, which is again, typically more geared towards things like TVOC removal. Um, so when we when we look at passive filters, um, 
you know, to simplify it, we talk about how they're essentially a sieve. And so as your efficiency increases, your holes in your, your holes in your filter get smaller. And, and the trade-off there is higher efficiency for higher energy consumption, because of course, more resistance equals higher static pressure, uh, but you get a higher uh, MERV efficiency out of it. Um, and, and all filters are using our, our general passive mechanisms um, of impingement or interception, straining and diffusion. And, and you'll notice that, you know, it's, as particles come through the airstream and, and get captured in the filter media, um, that's where the generalized description of filters being a sieve comes into play. You know, particles are filling those holes. And so, you know, anybody who has had experience with filters know that, you know, as those filters load, that static pressure increases exponentially. And uh, along with that static pressure, uh, comes your, your energy consumption on that unit. Um, so all filters are tested, you know, per ASHRAE 52.2. Uh, there's a number of other uh, international standards, uh, including the EN 779. ISO 16890 is a, is a standard that um, I think I would say CAMPHIL is kind of blazing the trail with, but again, meant to be sort of an international standard. Um, and then I also like to point out, you know, especially with COVID, a lot of conversation and, and, and comes into play with HEPA filters. And, and again, it's because they're trying to capture small particulates. Um, and so uh, it's important to understand that HEPA filters uh, use it, what's called the DOP test, which is different from how filters are tested for MERV ratings. So if someone says, hey, I've got a MERV 16 or a MERV 17 filter, which is almost the efficiency of a HEPA filter, uh, MERV 17 and HEPA filter are not the same thing. So uh, just keep that in mind that the HEPA is sort of in its in a category of its own. Um, so when we look at passive filter ratings, and, and I think this is sort of important to look at, as an industry uh, with passive filters, uh, we test to three size ranges based on on those on those uh, standards, specifically MERV 52.2. Um, and right now, for example, with COVID-19, we're being recommended to use MERV-13 filters. But if you look at the size ranges we test for or test in, range one is the smallest, 0.3, which is what HEPAs are going for, up to 1.0. At a MERV-13, a MERV-13 filter only needs to be 50% efficient in that size range to be considered a MERV-13. So, so MERV stands for Minimum Efficiency Reporting Values. So to be a MERV-13, you have to capture at least 50% of the smallest range of particulate that is in our airstream that we're trying to deal with. Now, the reason they recommended MERV-13 is because a vast majority of the droplet nuclei that are transferring COVID-19 land in this range to 1.0 to 3.0, which is, which is still at a minimum efficiency of 85%, leaving 15% of a gap to be made up for example. Um, so when we look at what we're trying to do in terms of positively impact IAQ, um, we're trying to find a, an air cleaning system, which can be a device like what Dynamic provides or a combination of devices, uh, and that can include a combination of different filters to improve that particle removal efficiency um, and or take out other particle matter like gases or vapors in the air. So if I were to just go back a slide, you know, your goal is to make up this 50% differential in your MERV-13 to help improve air quality and take more particulate out and reduce your risk of, of transfer, whether that's COVID or small particles from, you know, maybe you're at the airport and the small particles that, that give you that jet engine exhaust odor in your terminal. So dynamic is considered an air cleaning system because of, of our actively polarized media. And um, the reason being is because we use passive mechanisms like any regular filter. Um, so the filter products that do have a MERV rating associated with them, those products are tested as passive um, unpowered filter media. Uh, but when they are powered, you get a couple extra um, benefits, and, and those are polarization, electrostatic attraction, agglomeration, uh, excuse me, and agglomeration. So, so polarized fibers are going to collect polarized particles, and, um, and that creates bonding sites, and that helps take out small particles. Um, and then agglomeration is just a sort of a, a big word for, you know, saying that it, it increases Brownian motion. 
um, which is the particles grouping up. So um, polarized particles now uh, group up with each other more readily, making large particles. And a lot of times, because it's small particles with a natural charge, as those small particles enter the, the filter media, they become polarized. They group up into larger particulates and then are more easily filtered. Uh, and because ultrafine particles are absorbing VOCs and gas phase contaminants, that also allows products uh, in, the, in the polarized media world to have a, a level of VOC reduction without the use of carbon. And anybody who's familiar with carbon knows that it can be expensive and, and have a high static pressure uh, associated with it. So it's pretty unique to be able to not just help manage particulate with these types of products, uh, but also um, have an impact on things like VOCs and gas and gas phase. So uh, like I had mentioned, these, these products utilize the, your typical passive mechanisms but, but here's a better sort of idea of what polarization electrostatic attraction looks like. This is especially effective with the ultrafine and small particles that have a low settling rate um, as they move through the airstream um, and, and through the media at a slower velocity. They have this ability to, to take that polarization and find bonding sites to the media. So that helps, that helps improve that particulate removal efficiency. Uh, and the interesting thing as well about agglomeration, like I mentioned, is those polarized particles also become attracted to each other. So that helps them group up into larger particles and then electrostatic attraction helps remove some of those particles as well. Now, if, if electrostatic attraction doesn't help take that out on a first pass, you now have a larger particle that is either gonna be more easily filtered by secondary filtration downstream or very easy to filter on the second pass in a recirculated system. And, and, and truth be told, that's exactly what this type of technology was developed under a GOG grant for. Um, the intent was to make larger particles so that you could increase the efficiencies of HEPA filters downstream in nuclear weapons facilities. And again, the goal was to um, minimize the, 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 the breakthrough of small particles with natural charges that could cause corrosion or microelectronics failures. Um, so when you look back at things like the, the power filtration and look at the MERV parameter table, uh, products like the Dynamic V8, uh, a powered filter from Dynamic, um, in the, as a non-powered filter, it has a MERV 13 rating, uh, but as an operational value, uh, it's a MERV 15. So we're looking at 94% efficiency in operation. Um, so between that 85 and 95% first pass in that smallest range. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and of course that's backed up with things like data. Um, you know, we, we do as much testing as we can for projects uh, that we have installed. And uh, at 2121 K Street, we did uh, testing and monitoring for ultrafine and black carbon reduction. Uh, their concern, of course, was a heavy urban, heavily uh, urban area uh, next to a main, main thoroughway, so a lot of car vehicle traffic. Um, and so we were able to measure a 92 to 99 percent reduction of ultrafine particulates between the outside air and the inside air uh, through this section of uh, air cleaners, which is in the 75,000 CFM air handler. So uh, if anybody is interested in the data, I'm happy to share that um, uh, afterwards. I just I wanted to be able to throw... Uh, an example in there of how we measure ultrafine particle reduction. And, and because we have the ability to take, take that ultrafine particle quantity down, that of course translates into TVOC removal because ultrafine particles are absorbing volatile organic compounds. So in the example of, of a healthcare facility we did in Calgary, we measured 77% uh, and 91% reductions in TVOCs indoor and outdoor um, a, a across two different uh, testing ranges, but pretty pretty significant reductions considering that was without the use of, of carbon products. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so you know, with the with that aspect of VOC removal, you know, we also kind of look then at gas phase and biological control as well. So if biological control has sort of a relationship with small particles um, and small particles have a relationship with, with gas phase, we look at some of these other technologies that are utilized to, 
to help take care of this. And so dynamic specifically, we work with, uh, on, uh, with UVC. So UVC is our germicidal um, approach. Um, so properly applied, uh, it's very effective on biologicals, viruses, and mold. <coughs> um, and, and has been industry recommended and proven. Things like ozone generators have been used, but more for the exhaust system. O3 is not healthy for occupants. Uh, photocatalytic oxidization, again, is uh, basically a, a titanium Ti2 uh, and UVC reaction where free hydroxyl radicals are being used to manage um, biologicals or gas phase. Uh, and bipolar ionization is another one that's been really emerging during coronavirus where, where positive and negative ions are added um, to promote uh, particle reductions as well as using the, the ions and the, and the plasma field to help break down the, the DNA, RNA of biologicals and viruses. Um, but the reason I kind of throw that in there as well is um, a lot of these other, a lot of these products in terms of dealing with gas phase and biological control, um, if you think about your system design, still rely on, rely on filtration. So, you, you know, you'd still with photocatalytic oxidization, for example, that would act as a germicidal section of, a, of an HVAC system, for example, but would still require filtration, right? The, the, those products don't have MERV ratings. So um, it's important to, to kind of look at those technologies, <clears throat> but also your requirements for filtration um, and make sure that you're, you're meeting your MERV requirements. And so just to kind of touch on COVID again, what we know about COVID and biological inactivation is that it's going to live on surfaces from 24 to 72 hours, uh, and that includes filter media. So, you know, our primary, ASHRAE's primary recommendation is improve filtration. Why? We need to at least filter it out of the airstream. We need to, we need to get it out. Uh, so you can get it out with filters relatively easily. It's just it's going to live on the filter media as well. Uh, and over time, it will die on its own. Um, but given the chance, you know, things like UVC can, can kill it, and it can kill it pretty fast. Um, and uh, I guess just to touch on the ASHRAE recommendations, it's, it's sort of important to note that you know, UVC is a recommended technology by, by ASHRAE, um, but again, it's secondary to improving the filtration. And, and the reason being is, is when you inactivate a virus or a mold spore or bi a biological of any kind, it, it doesn't just get zapped and go away. You, you now have inactivated virus particulate floating through your airstream. So you still want to, filter that out. So if you, if you, even if you have UVC for your duct work and it's killing all the virus, it's not zapping it, making it disappear. You still want improved filtration to make sure you're removing that inactivated virus or mold or, or, or pathogen, whatever it might be. Um, so dynamic, for example, our UVC system is meant to work with our filters. Um, we use a standard 254 nanometer non-ozone producing lamp, but in terms of what ASHRAE rec recommends, uh, we've always used what we call a capture hold kill methodology. So we apply UVC to our filters uh, the same way that you might apply UVC to a coil for making sure a coil stays clean. Um, what this does is it allows us to uh, minimize the amount of space in a unit that is needed to put UVC to give proper dwell time for inactivation. Um, and it allows us to kind of do a two for one in terms of the ASHRAE recommendations. We're going to improve filtration to capture it and get it out of the airstream. And now that it's on the media, it has an unlimited contact exposure to the UVC light uh, to inactivate it. Um, and so this is the type of system that we used uh, to help with the Brentwood post office anthrax cleanup after 9-11. Uh, we still use this configuration for U.S. attorney offices, um, tuberculosis hospitals, and mo most recently, this is what we provide as a, as a pre-filter to a lot of the uh, government-based mobile hospital and isolation rooms that were going up for COVID-19. Um, and the other thing I guess I would just point out, just in terms of how UVC works from the biological side, is, you know, I've said, I've, not, I've noted that it is... Um, effective and an industry an industry recommended um, this particular chart is just a, a 250 or 254 nanometer bulb um, tested against a, 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 a sort of a bacteria surrogate to represent anthrax and so you know in this case the the configuration I just showed has the ability to inactivate anthrax 
um, in about five to 10 minutes in terms of contact time. And, and things like anthrax and spore-based um, contaminants are, are much, much more difficult to inactivate than viruses. And in sort of the grand scheme of things, viruses are, are, are pretty easy to inactivate with UVC or, or other types of technologies, but UVC is really, really effective. And so um, just as sort of an example of, of how it's used in the industry, um, it's used that way because, because it can be quite effective. Um, and, and then, <clears throat> you know, beyond just how we, we manage, um, you know, some of those, those components, um, you know, I, I, I would kind of go back to my, my point about, um, how the efficiency of fil filters work. And we're, we're in a, an area now where we're really trying to improve filtration efficiency and, and the trade-off of course is more resistance and more brake horsepower and more energy. And that's always sort of been a, 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 a challenge, an equation in, in how we're doing things with our static pressure. But even more so now when we look at, you know, trying to upgrade all of our existing systems to maybe a MERV 13 minimum per the ASHRAE recommendations for things like COVID. Um, but, you know, dynamic, we've always recognized that 90% of the cost of the filtration is, is, is basically energy. It's your, it's your static pressure. It's your, it's your cost of energy and your brake horsepower. So um, what I had mentioned before is that things, technologies like powered filtration um, help improve dust holding characteristics. And so um, these are a couple of the dynamic products on the long line, just in terms of a powered filter um, against some standard passive um, options and and you know the, the equation to reducing energy with filtration is, is pretty simple either you change the filters out a lot more often to keep static pressure low or you hold more dust um, and and dynamic for example takes the direction of holding more dust um, so you know if a standard filter were to be at 1.4 inches of static for example at a thousand grams of dust a product like the v8 might still be hovering around 0.4 inches of static at a thousand grams of dust. So when you look at dust holding versus static pressure, <coughs> excuse me, this sort of delta here is where you know HVAC systems and designers and engineers have an opportunity to make up quite a bit in energy. Um, that type of delta can can translate to you know in a, anywhere from a half inch to an inch and a quarter of of static pressure savings, and we're going to measure that in midlife static. So, you know, from that perspective, what does that look like? You know, in a 60,000 CFM air handler, that could that could net you a 91,000 kilowatt per hour savings, uh, reduce your fan brake horsepower by 11. Um, and like I mentioned before, this is where we are um, applying for uh, applying our product in lead buildings quite often for 90.1 for reduction of brake horse power. Um, pretty effective in, in that way. And, you know, from a, an owner's or an op cost standpoint, what does that, that look like? You know, that, that can be anywhere from $8,000 to $12,000 saved annually. Um, again, the, the sort of energy side that powered filtration provides can be looked at in other forms of lead, like, like reducing pounds of carbon or basically buying trees for carbon credits or 107 cars not driven, lower peak demand. Um, you know, but I, I kind of throw in an asterisk down here, smaller and quieter fans, which, you know, from a design standpoint is helpful, maybe smaller footprint, smaller fans, uh, but quieter fans is also a nice benefit for your for your your building owners and occupants as well. So that reducing static pressure in, in filters can have uh, quite a number of impacts. Um, and you know, and so much so, like I had mentioned before, that we before they moved to the new building, our products were the only air cleaners in in the ASHRAE headquarters. And so while I can't do it any any more necessarily, uh, maybe I can share it on the back end. Um, you know, we've had anywhere from eight to 10 years of ongoing data, um, thanks to our access to the ASHRAE headquarters BMS system. Um, and it's taking products, polarized media products, and measuring things like indoor outdoor uh, particle counts, indoor outdoor TVOC, for example. Um, and, and I think that's really, that's really. Uh, great that we can show that um, from the standpoint of 
of what power filtration can do in terms of improving filtration by getting smaller particles out and taking PVOCs out um, and, and kind of being an all-in-one. Um, but I think also more importantly, what that leads to is, is the importance in IEQ of measuring your results. Uh, and using things like IEQ sensors, um, you know, with Veritech uh, and some of the ION offerings, using ION counters, uh, since that could be in the air as well, and using things similar to what ASHRAE had been using to, to measure your, your, your actual air quality. And so, you know, there's all these, these bits of information and all these different ways that we can attack it. Um, you know, but like they say in lead, if you, if you meter it, you will manage it. It's, I think it's really um, important and advantageous to um, make sure you're monitoring your air quality as part of the effort as, as well. Um, and, and there's a number of products that, that are out there to do that. Um, and of course, uh, some of them available through uh, Veritech. So um, that'd be something great to, to, you know, ask the Veritech guys about. IEQ sensors are great. Um, Dynamic loves the opportunity to, of course, have that data being active in real time. And so the, the, the group at um, Veritech can definitely help out with that. So, um, you know, in conclusion, um, I hope that this was, was helpful. Um, again, my goal here was, was uh, definitely to help give a better idea of what filtration looks like in our HVAC system, uh, just beyond, and beyond the protection of the equipment. Um, so hopefully we have a better understanding of small and ultrafine particulates and how they contribute to the contamination of, of indoor air and indoor health. Um, and, you know, also kind of understanding that wall passive filters uh, are proven and effective. There are options out there um, for performance to improve um, on some of those uh, gaps that I guess you could call them the, in terms of what our minimum efficiency reporting is. Uh, so, you know, there are options out there to improve our particulate filtration, to take things like TVOCs out, um, and, and also give us some, some energy, some maintenance uh, benefits <clears throat> as well. So, uh, again, I appreciate everybody's time. Thanks again, Alan and Veritech, for, for getting this set up, um, and I, I would be happy to answer uh, any questions at this point as well. Hey, Mike, this is Jim Richardson out of Albuquerque. Hey, Jim. Uh, on your electrostatic filter, uh, does that have a MERV rating? Our public education department wants us to put in MERV 13s and uh, HEPA filters in each classroom. So mm -hmm. if I supplement, I'm going to be putting in some new air conditioners. So I want to supplement my new air conditioners with uh, UVC or maybe bipolar ionization. Uh, but I don't know what that's going to be equivalent to in MERV filtration. And I don't think PED will uh, okay it unless I can tell them that this is equivalent to MERV 13, even though I may only have MERV 8s or MERV 10s in there. Right. Yeah, there's uh, Dynamic has a, a range of products. <clears throat> the V8, for example, is, is what we tend to use in our larger commercial applications. And those do, that product does have a, a MERV 13 as well as a MERV 14 rating, which we use for healthcare. Um, some of our, <clears throat> what we call glass media products that we sell in one and two inch panel types have a MERV equivalency. Um, and that equivalency is based on, on recirculated air. Um, and so I'm not sure if, any, if everybody's familiar with the equivalency, but it's, it's essentially the, the appendix of the ash of, of, of 52.2 that says um, if, you can, if you can remove indoor particle counts to the equivalency of what a MERV-13 would have removed on the first pass, equivalent, it's equivalent. Okay. Um, and that, of course, that, that, that conversation of equivalency also, of course, creates some challenges, even in the situation that, that you're in, because... Um, I think the general understanding is, well, I just want the MERV rating. So, um, so the the sort of solution that that we've used in certain examples, uh, like school districts, is we've done something like take a one inch or two inch uh, dynamic panel and paired it with a one inch or two inch MERV thirteen pleated filter to fulfill that. MERV, full MERV requirement. Um, and, you know, 
what we don't tend to do um, is we don't tend to take lower MERV rated filters and put them after our product um, because I think it's prudent to kind of plan for worst case. So uh, not, not that it ever really happens very often, but if our panel were to turn off, um, now you're basically relying on its, its passive filtration ability plus the passive filtration ability of that lower MERV rated filter downstream. So maybe the two combined equal MERV 13, or maybe now you have a, a MERV 10 and, and now you're just at MERV 10 efficiency. And I see sort of the same risk even with, I think ionizers do that quite a bit. It's kind of like, well, you know, the a MERV 8 might become as efficient as a MERV 13 when it's downstream, but but what if it turns off? It's always kind of like that, that safety factor, what if it turns off? So I typically recommend um, if the equivalency aspect becomes a problem, just in from just from sort of the nomenclature of it, I recommend putting an actual MERV 13 filter in it. Um, and I can't really, I guess I don't know if I'd really speak to the 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 HEPA. If you were to put a HEPA in the room, I would say don't put the extra MERV 13 in it. Use just the standard panel. And if you have a HEPA, you're you're definitely more than covered. And that agglomeration aspect, um, you know, definitely helps improve your your HEPA filtration. So um, it would be overkill to do a polarized media plus MERV-13 uh, filter plus a HEPA filter. Okay. Yeah, well, we can't handle MERV-13, and many many schools in New Mexico can't handle MERV-13 either. Even, even... Yeah, I think the thing... You know, we have to... I think the thing to... to I'm sorry, Jim. That's the right. thing to check with them about is, is, is in recirculated air. Now, I mean, the challenge with, with COVID is the initial recommendations were to not recirculate uh, the indoor the indoor air just exhaust it, which has its own challenges as well. So um, I think with any air cleaner type product, um, they they do work best and most efficiently in the in the recirculated part of the airstream where you can use it that way. Same with ionizers, same with PCO, um, even filters, for example. I mean, filters will improve their filtration over time as you recirc that indoor air and that indoor air level comes down. So. Um, you know, if there's if there's opportunities to put it in in recirculated air systems, um, uh, in conjunction maybe with units that have to to use MERV 13s, maybe that's a way to approach it as well. Um, but in recirculated air systems, the polarized air medias can can reach the uh, indoor reductions, you know, equivalent to MERV 14, MERV 15 over time. You know, 99, 98% reduction at the 0 0.03 micron, in the 0 0.3 micron range. So. Um, but again, that requires recirculated air. Yeah, our air is recirculated, and um, we do have some makeup depending on what 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 building we're in. So it sounds like that your lead yeah. static filters uh, will satisfy the MERV 13 requirement. Several of them you mentioned earlier in our discussion. Uh, simply by putting those in, we would then satisfy the MERV 13 requirement for the public education department. Does that make sense? Yeah, that would make sense to me. And, um, you know, and I'd also be sure, you know, the public education department, and, and I know just from experience of talking with a couple different school districts is they're, they're making requirements for MERV 13. Um, you know, I think ASHRAE recognizes the challenges in getting MERV 13 into our existing systems. And so, you know, it's maybe worth noting or reminding them that, you know, ASHRAE has in their recommendation said, yes, MERV 13 or higher is, is best practice that's good to do understanding that not all systems can do that the you know the best the best available is is the next best thing you can do as well so and that might be that might be because of system restrictions not being able to handle the static pressure uh supply chain i know the hard it's hard to get passive MERV 13 filters right now they have long lead times so um everybody really wants the MERV 13s um because that's what ashray kind of put out as the recommendation but uh, things like polarized air cleaner, like uh, air cleaning panels, would rec would satisfy just the the at, least, at the very least the ASHRAE recommendation for improving filtration. Um, and so, if you can't get MERV 13, whatever the next best is that you can get up to is 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 how the the ASHRAE recommendation reads. Okay, thank you. There are a couple of questions in the chat. Um, I don't know if Alan got his questions answered while you were um, going, no. but take a look at those. 
Mm-hmm. You, you see him, Mike, or I can ask him. So, um, Jim, one thing back on the conversation, you know, with PD and everything else, there is, yeah, I mean, vast majority of our schools in the state, root our systems don't have the ability to accommodate a MER 13 filtration level. And, you know, as you saw in Mike's information that Mike provided was, you know, even that MR13 filter, you know, the, the capture rate of smaller particles, the, really the size we're looking at for, you know, COVID and other pathogens being under 0.5 is very limited. So I think, you know, even considering going to a panel filter with a, a UV light, you know, and using kind of a capture kill is another option uh, to consider to provide an equivalent MER 13 plus effectiveness. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, and if you want me to expand on that, Alan, you, you had a question about or, or a point about refer, what the difference between first pass filtration um, compared to overall system efficiency. Um, and that, and that's kind of, I think, a good segue because, you know, again, filters are tested. Those minimum efficiencies are based on how much it catches on a, on a single pass. Um, and as we've alluded to and, and talked about with applications, a lot of times systems have, you know, recirculated air or, or utilize recirculated air. And so um, that first pass a lot of times is, is talking about what it's taking out, maybe from the outdoor air in on that one time and like we saw in the chart there's a percentage that gets through that so when you introduce things like recirculated air and that air then gets treated by something like in like an air cleaner that provides you an opportunity to start scrubbing out in your indoor air start scrubbing out those particles or pathogens that might have bypassed the filters on the first on the first try and that's where things like ASHRAE 62.1 come into play for reducing outside air you know it says you know, look, if, if you can make really clean air by constantly recycling the inside air and taking things out with air cleaners, then then you don't necessarily need to introduce as much outside air. And that makes a lot of sense, especially in urban environments where introducing outside air uh, may be introducing more pollutants into the, the building than, than initially thought. And so if you ever take a look at things like ASHRAE non-attainment zones that have a pretty good uh, map to designate where some of those bad urban air quality areas are and kind of makes the case for continually cleaning your indoor air since the outside air might be more dirty than what you already have inside anyway. Uh, so hopefully I don't that kind of that kind of touched on and is that where you're maybe going yeah. with it? Yeah, I just because it's trying yeah. to look could you you had referred several times to uh, first pass first, you know, mm-hmm. make sure everyone's clear on the difference between first pass and why that was important to know uh, on that. And then a uh, quick follow up, Mike, have you seen uh, any data that shows what agglomeration, you know, how a air cleaning product that agglomerates affects the overall um, efficiency of a, of a filtration system? In other words, you know, if you're agglomerating in your airstream, how does that, you know, how much effect does that have on your actual filtration efficiency? Yeah, um, yeah. There's 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 a handful of tests and some that we've done our, ourselves. And and you know, if you think about how agglomeration works, it's kind of an interesting sort of phenomenon because most particle counters are counting at maybe the smallest range are counting down to 0.3 microns. You know, maybe like what a HEPA is getting. Um, so with a lot of you know types of air cleaners, you know. For, for power filtration, agglomeration is the is the mechanism of air cleaning. And so, like for example, bipolar ionization, ionization and ions are the mechanism of air cleaning. That's how they're trying to group things up and pull things out. And uh, agglomeration, same thing. That's our mechanism of, of air cleaning. And, and when you when you measure particle counts upstream and downstream of filters, um, what is sort of interesting is downstream of air cleaners, you tend to see a spike in things like 0.3, 0.5 smaller particles. You you initially on an air chain start to see a spike. 
Uh, and that's because uh, a lot of particles smaller than 0.3 or in the ultrafine range, which aren't being read upstream by the particle counter, have now agglomerated or attached to each other because of like ions, let's say. And, and they've, they've agglomerated into a particle large enough now that the particle counter downstream is seeing it and counting it. So it's interesting when you see some of the data on it, it's almost like a, a, a bell curve of sort. You see a little spike and then a dramatic reduction. Um, and especially if you do it um, in, a, in a system with downstream filtration like a HEPA or a downstream MERV-13, um, then you tend to see really improved efficiencies uh, of that downstream filter. Um, and I think like GPS, for example, Alan has a test like that where it shows kind of, you know, what that MERV, uh, whatever filter is and, and how much improved it looks, you know, based on that kind of upstream downstream count. So um, in general, in general, agglomeration and, and ionization type things um, can do a great deal to improve uh, standard filtration as well, which was sort of its original goal. Um, if you're going to use it with standard fil uh, filtration. Um, the unique thing about dynamic, and I think in the powered filters is, is especially with certain products that have the MERV ratings, um, it's the filter as well, right? So that way you have sort of that air cleaning aspect and the filter. So if you were to do a healthcare facility and use the V8, the V8 has a MERV uh, 14 rating, uh, but also has that those those air cleaning aspects to it. So we use it as a final filter quite often rather than a pre-filter with a HEPA downstream, which would also be a very acceptable configuration. But, you know, that's where you can kind of start playing with, um, you know, the, the air cleaners, how they how their technology works and how do you leverage them complementary with with other types of products that are out there. Uh, same thing with carbon. I mean, we use a lot of products in uh, the cannabis world. Um, and we use things like the VA quite often, um, not just for the, the particle reduction and energy aspect, but because it has a 40 to 60% TVOC removal efficiency. And so what that does is it helps make carbon last a lot longer downstream. Uh, so it, it, it takes that load of organic compound removal off carbon and the carbon downstream can, can handle the rest. And, and I'd say the other way, Alan, that you can look at the way uh, a product like a powered filter improves efficiency there's there's filtration removal efficiency and then there's just sort of like you know operational cost efficiency how long is it going to last what's the static pressure um you know if you're going to take a product as a pre-filter like a v8 and put it upstream of a hepa filter and the v8 is capturing 98.1 percent of all half micron particulates well now your hepa filter um you know, should expect you should expect to have a longer life on your HEPA filter because now your HEPA filter is focusing primarily on on particulate in the 0 0.5, 4, and 3 range only, and not getting loaded with a bunch of big basketball particulate that might have gone through a MERV 8, for example. You know, so um, those are, that's another unique way and a good way to look at how we're dealing with filtration because you know beyond just IAQ, there's also some sort of you know funny inconsistencies in how we and how we do it for design uh how we design it just to protect our, our air handling equipment you know i mean not to belabor the point but i mean in, in ashray 170 an operating air handler only operating room air handler only needs a merv 8 pre-filter on the coil so you know a merv 8 is not going to do a whole lot to keep your coil clean so what do we do we, we slap a bunch of uvc on it it's like well you know if you put better filtration upstream you could probably protect your coil and then put put something like a, like a HEPA downstream and, and get better get better operational cost out of that, out of that HEPA filter. It's, it's going to last longer. It's not dealing with as much big particulate. So um, a lot of really unique ways to leverage the products and, and, and think about it for, you know, HVAC design or for indoor air quality. Mike, this is Jim once again. Let me ask you a quick question, then you can finish that. Uh, <laughs> on, the power, on the power filter, does that have to be sealed like a MERV-13? In your HVAC system, to be effective. Yeah, we we yeah we actually design them to be to be zero bypass. So the okay. based on the way that they're they're meant to be installed and sealed, it would all be all be zero bypass. Okay. All right. Good. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? We certainly appreciate everyone spending time with us today. Uh, hopefully, it's been. In informative and helpful for everyone.
It has very much. Thank you very much. It's well done. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Mike, and thank you, everybody. Thank you, Alex. Yeah. Yep. All right. Thanks, everyone. We everyone have a great day. I think Kelly will be sending out some uh, a quick little follow up uh, survey, and then also some uh, PDH stuff, and all the other good stuff. Uh, you're Which gonna I'm send. Gonna... You're gonna send a PowerPoint too, so we can look at it. Mike, is it shareable? Yes. All right. Yep. Great. I have a I have a copy in the uh, the Veritech Dropbox that can be uh, printed to PDF or shared. Okay. Great. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks All very right. much. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, everybody. Appreciate Thanks for the time. time. Thank you. All right. You bet. Bye-bye.